check out this cool little camera dolly I made with a 3D printer. It came from a kit, but before I could make it, I had to buy a 3D printer. Here's how I picked one out. We've been using Edelkron camera equipment around CNET for a while now, so when I saw they had a line of products you could print at home, I was intrigued. The Edelkron kits come with the plans you need to print out the main pieces, plus all the little screws and other machined aluminum parts required to put them all together. There's just one little problem though, I don't have a 3D printer. I've been interested in learning more about 3D printing though, and this seems like the perfect excuse to dive in. I started looking around online to see what printer I should buy for this project. Needless to say, there are tons of options out there, different sizes, different features, and of course everyone has an opinion. I didn't know how I was going to pick the right printer, so I figured I should ask a nerd. Or more specifically, the 3D printing nerd. Right here, a 3D printing nerd! This is Joel Telling, the self-professed 3D printing nerd. Joel has a popular YouTube channel all about 3D printing, or additive manufacturing, as he likes to call it. He reviews all the new machines when they come out, and offers lots of great advice for people just getting started. Luckily for me, he agreed to help narrow down my options. As you know, I am a total novice when it comes to 3D printing. What are some of the basic things I should be looking for as a first-time buyer? You want to make sure you under understand the... the 3D printing process, and it—I mean, I, I liked—I liken it to a robotic arm with a glue gun. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you can imagine that, right? Sure. And then, uh, as far as the additive process or the 3D printing process goes, I liken it to building a cake. So, if you if you have a flat piece of cake, then you add a layer of frosting. Well, if you need another layer of frosting, you know you can't put frosting in midair, you have to build it up on top of other frosting. And that's essentially what a 3D printer does. It's just not frosting, it's typically melted plastic. You wanna know how wide your cake is and you wanna know how deep your cake goes. And then you wanna know how tall your frosting stack can go. So in 3D printing, that's uh, the wide is your X axis, the deep is your Y, and then the tall is your Z or Z, depending on what part of the world you're, you're speaking to. The, the size of the nozzle that the plastic melts in is going to be something that you have to pay attention to. Also, how hot it can get determines the type of materials that you can print how much your budget is and how much space you have. What are the materials that we're talking about and what's kind of the best one to, for a beginner to start with? The best one for a beginner is something called PLA. It's, it's a plastic with a certain melting temperature that's probably one of the easiest materials to print. You can print other materials as well that are similar uh, in, their, in their range where they melt. There's something called PET or PETG, PET bottles that you get soft drinks and waters in, you, that material is printable. ABS material, it's the same stuff Lego is made out of. And if you if you print stuff with it and step on it, it'll hurt your foot if you're barefoot, just like a Lego will. All right, so PLA is probably where I wanna get started. So this first project I wanna make is in the 20 by 20 centimeters range. Is that a large size? Is that a small size? There are lots of different 3D printers out there in in a lower price range and usually you'll see an x axis of like 210 millimeters or 21 centimeters with a with a y axis like 200 to 240 millimeters so honestly that that size that edelkron is asking for is pretty median at this point and you shouldn't have any problems doing that this 20 by 20 size allows you to print basically all the pieces at once versus printing them individually, which would then would be a smaller footprint. Is there a plus or minus to either one of those tactics? You want to make sure your machine can do that because if one print fails out of all of the pieces, there's a good chance they all have to fail and you have to clear the plate. But if your machine is reliable, you should have a problem with this. And, and this is where printing all of the parts all at once kind of can be cool because essentially what you can do is set them to go overnight and then you wake up and it's like Christmas morning. You have all these parts ready for you to put together. In some of my early research, I saw that there are models that are just complete units that you buy off the shelf, or there are also kits that you can put together to create your own machine. You're gonna pay more money for a fully assembled kit, but so getting a kit means you're going to learn about that machine. Taking the time to put all of the pieces together really teaches you about how it works. And invariably, when something goes wrong in the future, you'll have an easier time troubleshooting and you'll know what to check just because you have intimate knowledge of how this machine went together. Are there any other bells and whistles that I should be looking for? A lot of machines these days come with sensors and probes that have, that allow for automatic bed leveling. I mean, it's always best to know how to get that 
that print bed as level to the nozzle as possible, but then having the automatic ability for the machine to just compensate for any little bits that might not be as level as they should be, it's a great feature. Also, filament detection. Rather than it printing in midair because there's no filament going through it, filament detection allows the machine to know when it's out of filament. And so then it can pause the print and wait for you to put new filament into it. Those two things right there are gonna really make it, I don't wanna say foolproof, but you know, make it a little bit more enjoyable and reduce the amount of failures you might have. Adding some of those extra features probably raises the price on these things. I'm hoping to keep this under 500 bucks. Is that a reasonable target or would I be happier if I was willing to fork over a little bit more cash? <laughs> Creality out of China puts out something called the Ender 3. You'll get that for two to $250. And it comes as a kit with some instructions and you get to put it together and configure it and calibrate it. You can add on the auto bed leveling or the filament sensors. Those are available either from the company or from third parties who make parts that you can just add on to it. And then once you have this machine, there's communities around it and parts you can print for it. So you're you're well under your two hundred or your five hundred dollar budget, which means that you can afford to get a few different colors or types of PLA material, and honestly, just print all the things. But besides the Ender Three, there are a lot of very similar or clone machines that look like that style and you can get them for a few hundred dollars as well. Also out of the Czech Republic is Prusa Research and they have their mini 3D printer. That's 349 US. It comes mostly assembled. Prusa Research is known for having a really good out of the box experience and so it helps you calibrate the machine. It helps you get your first print. Prusa Research also puts out their own filament and their own slicer to be able to take the models and slice them for the machine. So you have an ecosystem built in there. Now, say I just decide that I'm not ready to put together this thing and I want to buy something self-contained. What would be your recommendation in that direction? Personally, uh, what I would recommend for something like that is, is a is a Prusa Research Mark 3S 3D printer. I believe it's 949 or 999 US. It's fully assembled from the Czech Republic. And that's one of the ones where, uh, I mean, you might have to tighten a few things down, but it comes with a very easy to do first run experience. I've had friends get these and they've taken them out of the box, they've hit go, and then they, they start printing just like that. That's probably the go-to, the one I recommend the most to people who want just a machine that can show up on their doorstep and start printing right away. They offer that as a kit for a few hundred dollars less. And so we're still over your budget, but it's slightly less money. All right, thanks, Joel. That's a lot of good tips, a lot to think about. I think I know which way I'm leaning, but I'm gonna look at your advice a little more before I make my final decision. I'm glad I could give you at least some, some information and, and I'll hopefully point you in the right direction. So after talking to Joel and looking around some more myself, it really comes down to a couple choices. The Ender 3 from Creality and the original Prusa 3 Mini from Prusa Research. Let's see how they stack up. The Ender 3 has just about everything Joel mentioned and that I'm looking for. The print volume is big enough to print all the Edelchrome parts all at once if I want to go that route. It comes in a kit, so that keeps the cost down, but it doesn't look too hard to assemble. Creality offers the bed leveling sensor as a $50 add-on, but if I want a filament sensor, I'll have to look around to get that elsewhere, but they're available for around 20 bucks. So if I add the bed leveling sensor plus a roll of filament to my cart, it comes to a total of $279.99 plus shipping. There's also the Ender 3 Pro, which offers some upgrades to the base model, but the one that really caught my eye is the newer Ender 3 V2. This one starts at 269 and features an updated mainboard that promises quieter printing than the other two machines, a simpler user interface aimed at beginners, like me, and other additions to improve print accuracy and performance. The V2 with the auto bed leveling sensor and a reel of filament comes to $341.99, still within my budget. Finally, there's the Prusa Mini from Prusa Research. The Mini's print volume is a little too small to print the Skater 3D parts all at once, but can certainly handle them one at a time. Assembly is also required on this one, but it does come with gummy bears, which is a plus. Auto bed leveling is built in, and you can buy a filament sensor for 20 bucks, which I will do. Add a spool of filament for another 25, and that brings us to 391.49. About $50 more than the Ender 3 V2, but still within my budget. One final thing to consider is shipping. 
Right now, Prusa Research offers two to three day shipping from the Czech Republic via FedEx for about $50, but has a lead time of seven weeks on new orders shipping to the US. For Creality, orders of the V2 shipping from the US and Canada are currently sold out, so you can choose to get them from China or the Czech Republic. Right now, their website says shipping takes three to nine business days to arrive in the US, which sounds a lot better than seven weeks. And shipping is free. I even got a coupon code for $10 off as a new customer, so my total now is only $331.99. That's pretty good compared to $440 all in for the Prusa Mini. All right, I made up my mind. All that's left to do now is click buy, or I guess complete order. So which one did I get? I'm gonna keep that a secret till the box shows up. Okay, here it is, my brand new 3D printer. Can you guess what's inside here? Some of you probably can just based on the shape of the box. Before I open this up, a couple things. You probably noticed my setup looks a little different. That's because while this was being shipped to me, I was moving from San Francisco to Southern California. But now I'm here, the box is here, and it's time to reveal which 3D printer I'd end up buying. So, ta-da! I went with the Ender 3 V2, and it actually ended up getting here a lot faster than I expected, so it was waiting for me when I got to town. And of course, here's the bed leveling sensor, and a spool of gray PLA filament. Not the most exciting color, but I thought it might show up better on camera. Well, why don't we take a look inside and see what we got here. Instructions, definitely we'll need those. Some nice padding. And if I carefully lift this off of here, there it is. The printing platform. Let's take a look. Here's something. I'm not gonna be able to figure this all out on my own, but I got the instructions here. There are YouTube videos I can watch, but now it's time for me to put together my new 3D printer. All right, well that was relatively painless. It only took me a couple hours to put it together. So before I plug it in and turn it on, let's take a look at some of the features of the Ender 3 V2. Down here we've got the new glass plate where the models will be built. If I take these little clips off, I can also peel off this plastic, which I'm supposed to do. That satisfying peel. And underneath here is the nozzle where the filament actually comes out. The V2 also has this hidden storage compartment down here for your tools and extra parts. There are supposed to be extra parts, right? I think so. It comes with this pair of snips for cutting off your filament. It also comes with a sample package of white filament. It's got this little spatula for removing your model from the print bed. And a micro SD card with a card reader so you can connect it to your printer and load on the models you want to print. And like I told you before, I did order the BL Touch bed leveler, which is right here. But I decided I was going to go ahead and try and get the base model working properly before I started doing any modifications. But now the time has finally come to turn this thing on and get it calibrated. Here's the new color screen and updated interface. So the first thing I want to do is go to prepare and then auto home. All the parts are going to move until they hit their limit switches. And it worked. Apparently I put this thing together correctly. Now the next thing I need to do is level the bed. Now that's a whole process and I'm not going to show you the whole thing here. But basically I need to make sure the print bed is at a uniform height in relation to the nozzle. The manual process is turning these four knobs under each of the corners until the nozzle is just barely scraping the paper. It takes a few tries but I think I got it pretty close. But let's do a test print to find out. One thing I just discovered is that this SD card contains the manual for the printer, the video that shows you how to put it together, and the slicer software that we talked about with Joel before. Luckily it contains a couple of those G-code files ready to go, so I don't have to mess with that other stuff right now and I can try to print something right away. So first I need to preheat the nozzle and the bed. It takes a few minutes to get up to temperature. Now I have to load the filament onto the holder, cut the end off at a 45 degree angle, and then feed it into the extruder. Success! This thing is actually working. That's very exciting. I guess the best thing to do right now is print our test print. 
To do that, you load in the SD card, come over here to print, and here we see two models ready to go. We've got the dog and the cat. I'm gonna go with the cat for my first print. From what I've seen online, it can take three to five hours to print the cat. It's getting a little late to start that here tonight. So what I'm gonna do is shut this down for tonight, but the next thing you're gonna see is tomorrow morning. And we're back. It's time for our test print. It's preheated. So now we're gonna go back up here to the print menu. Maybe sometime we'll do the dog, but today we're doing the cat. And we're gonna hit print. It's moving into position and getting started. And it's going, my first 3D print. So like I said, this is gonna take hours. So I'm gonna speed this up and we'll check in when it's done. Look at that, it's all done. And I have to say it looks pretty good. Although there's a couple questions I've got. One, what is that weird little ball of filament that showed up over there? And also, I guess these are some kind of supports to help hold it up as it's being built, but I wasn't expecting that. Looking at the display, it took three hours and 40 minutes for the model to print, which is on the short side of what I was expecting, so that's good. Now let's take a look here. As it was building, I was wondering what the heck this part was over here. But as I got closer, I realized that it was there to hold up the paw as it was printing. There's also this part across the front, which I can't see it doing anything useful, but maybe I'm misinformed. Otherwise, this thing looks pretty darn smooth. Looking at these first few layers, there's probably some adjustments that need to be made. Or there's a different problem that I'm not aware of. And also, as we got closer to the top, things look pretty good, but a little jagged here on the ears. But this is my first print, so I don't know exactly how much of this is supposed to look this way or how much of it are things that need to be fixed. But let's try and pop off these supports and see what happens. Oh yeah, that's better. Now how about this front? I'm sure there's some kind of technique for getting these little pieces off of here, so I'm gonna have to look that up. Then now we can see the detail of that little section on the front. All in all, I'm gonna call this a pretty successful first print. Obviously, there's a few things I still need to figure out. There's probably some adjustments that need to be made to the machine, but I'm gonna do some more research, a few more test prints, but then hopefully I'll be able to get this thing calibrated and we'll be ready to print out the Edelkrone parts. Cut to a couple weeks later. I got a little distracted, but I have been knocking out some test prints and I think they're looking pretty good. This here is called Benchy, which I learned is more than just a cute little boat, but also demonstrates a lot of potential problem areas like circles, overhangs, etc. And there's this guy, a very detailed 3D printer test, which demonstrates a lot of things to look out for. The large text on the front came out nice and clear, but the smaller text inside could use a little work. Also, the overhang test came out pretty good, except for right up here at the very top. And of course, there were some other prints that didn't really come out too well. I know there are still a lot of adjustments I can work on, and if you have any suggestions for some of these problems, please leave them in the comments. But I decided it was time to try out the real thing. I ended up buying a few of the different Edelkrone kits, and these are some of the pieces for the Foam Grip 3D. These are turning out pretty good. Not perfect, but I think they're gonna work. I had a few misprints along the way, but cleaning the print bed helped with that. My biggest issue is with these rounded corners, but on this piece, it's not gonna be a problem, so I'm gonna keep going. Now it's really time to print out the parts for the Skater 3D, the whole reason I got into this mess in the first place. One of the most important things I've learned is that 3D printing isn't fast. Each one of these little pieces takes over an hour to print, and the bigger ones can take several hours. That is using an 80% infill to make these nice and strong, but still, that's a long time. These are the pre-made parts that come with the Skater 3D, but it's gonna take me 22 hours to print out the pieces I need to make myself. That's whether I do all the pieces individually or all at once, and I'm not really keen on letting it run overnight yet especially when things like this happen and ruin the whole thing. Joel was right, doing the parts individually gives you a lot more control. Plus, the instructions say the wheels need to have a very precise tolerance so the bearings work correctly, so I might have to try a couple different sizes to find the right fit. 
Cue the time-lapse music. I've got at least 22 hours of printing ahead of me. Okay, here they are. These are all the pieces I needed to print for the Skater 3D. I've got these two big plates, I've got this little bracket thingy, and two halves of all four wheels. I put this one together already to make sure that I had the right size printed and that the bearings would fit. And here are all my prints that failed for some reason or weren't the right size, plus this extra plate that I printed for no good reason because I picked the wrong model on the printer. Now all that's left to do is put everything together using the parts that came in the Edelchrome kit. Hang tight. Well, I'll be. It actually worked. I now have a working mini camera dolly using prefab parts and parts I printed myself. I wouldn't exactly say it was easy to put together. Some of those screws were a little tough to get through the holes. I'm not sure if that's a factor of my printing or the design itself, but it did go together and it feels very sturdy and rugged. I have to say after all this time it's pretty satisfying to get to this point. And now I can start using the slider 3D in my other videos to get some creative shots that I couldn't before. This particular model is made to work with some of Edelkron's other products that they make, but with this little fluid head mount and this phone holder, I think it's going to work just fine. So what did I learn during this whole process? Way more than I expected. First of all, there are so many different kinds of printers out there. It's really important to decide what you want to use it for and how much you want to spend. But you don't have to break the bank to get quality prints. I still haven't gotten around to installing this auto bed leveler yet, and I don't think it's really slowing me down. But I'll have to try it out one of these days to see if it makes life easier. I also learned that once you have your printer, you'll probably never be done making adjustments to your machine or to your printing process. Whether it's tweaking the settings in your slicer software, or experimenting with the right hot end and bed temperatures, there's no such thing as getting your setup perfect. And speaking of software, even though Creality offers their own slicer, I have found Prusa Slicer to be more intuitive for me. Plus it runs on my Mac, which is more convenient. I've learned a lot about things like infill, stringing, bed adhesion, warping, all of this was new to me, and most of it I learned while trying to fix problems along the way. But luckily there's no shortage of help available online. Simplify 3D has a great visual troubleshooting page, so you can just look for the picture of what's going wrong with your print and find some suggestions for fixing it. But probably the biggest thing I've learned is that I now have so much more to learn, and that's really going to be the fun part. I want to learn how to design my own models to print, hopefully without having to learn CAD to do so. I want to connect my printer to my network, or at least to my computer, so I don't have to keep shuttling this little SD card back and forth. And finally, I really want to get this glow-in-the-dark filament to print nicely so I can print this giant Lego skeleton I've got my eye on. I started to do it in white in the meantime, but I've got some warping going on here on the side that I need to fix before I go any further. I think my bed might be heating unevenly, but that's for another day. So thank you for joining me on this journey from 3D printing novice to, let's say, informed beginner. I hope it's helped you decide whether to dive into the world of 3D printing, or maybe shown you some things to avoid. Thank you to Joel, the 3D printing nerd, for getting me started down this path. Be sure to check out his YouTube channel to learn from a real pro. And be sure to come back here to our channel for even more how-to videos. And for serious, if you have any tips on how to solve any of the printing problems I've had in this video, please leave them in the comments below. Now it's time to put this thing to work.